like to welcome you to this panel which is going to discuss Wahela Lack's book, Restating Orientalism, The Critic of Modern Knowledge. I'm supposed to be the chair to make sure that I will be policing my colleague and pushing them to keep the time to be able to have not only you know, intervention by my colleagues about the book, but to have also a discussion with the audience. So thank you for coming. This is an important book which needs actually to be debated in a space like Columbia University because it's a book about modernity and it's the continuation of Wahel's engagement with modern form of knowledge, interrogating simultaneously on one hand the Muslim self, considering the relationship between knowledge and power in the Islamic tradition of modernity on one hand, its place and existence from Western modernity. And if you know his two previous books, which are very important, Sharia, Theory, Practice, Transformation, and The Impossible State, Islam, Politics, and Modernity, Moral Prediction, you see who are quite clearly what this book is about. The one question I had after reading it was to ask myself if Actually, his engagement, this book about modernity, was triggered by uh, reading again and again Said, or is, is it his engagement with modernity who turned him into actually engaging with Said's major proposition about, <coughs> about Orientalism? So I would like to ask Wahel to give us a short presentation of the book before my colleagues engage. Wahel is the Avalon Foundation Professor in the Humanities at Misas. Thank you, Mamadou. Uh, I, I shall police myself, I promise you. Uh, but first, I would like to thank uh, uh, everyone uh, who ha has attended today and uh, my distinguished colleagues on the panel uh, availing themselves to debate uh, some of the issues of the book. And uh, I would like uh, very much to thank the Heyman Center and especially uh, Emily Bloom for all his, her work on, uh, on, on making this, all of this possible. In fact, it is only due to her that this was um, what came to reality. Um, I think one way to capture the broad arguments of uh, restating Orientalism is to begin with the language of the book's blur, uh, which happened to be written by Columbia University Press's editor. I just approved it. <laughs> uh, there, the book is described as re-evaluating, that's the word used, deepening, and extending the critique of Orientalism. I want first to note that many of you may not be certain now whether the term Orientalism here refers to the academic discipline or to Said's uh, title. Uh, of course, no one is to be blamed for that. But this ambiguity itself is significant and quite telling. Said's work, despite major problems in it, still dominates uh, a phenomenon that I take seriously in the book, that is, and elsewhere. Uh, why is this the case? Um, why the canonicity of the book? I take these questions and their answers to be precisely the manifestations of one of the prob problems in academia itself, especially in liberal epistemology and much of so-called post-colonial studies. This is why I take Said's work seriously, although I must stress very much that my book does not take the author and his work as its terminus ad quem. I want to go back to the idea of extending on the blur. Uh, namely, that I extend the critique of Orientalism beyond Said's and the field of discourse that his work has spun. Yet I'm afraid that this extending is not the truth, the whole truth, and not, certainly nothing uh, 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 
that has to do with the full truth. It is, in fact, a half-truth, if you will. I could not really even begin to extend Saeed's critique when he, like almost every scholar engaged in such matters, applies the term left and right almost to any idea or person writing about anything Islamic, Asian, or African. Statements like, you are an Orientalist, she's an Orientalist, have become so such a political weapon to be wielded against uh, anyone whose ideas you find politically objectionable. Uh, to be honest with you, this is one of the things that actually uh, in the beginning made me think about I need to clarify this, and it ended up to be a book. This is partly because Saeed erroneously taught us that Orientalists are to be found everywhere, from ancient Greece to 13th century Latin scholars to von Gronebaum, Bernard Lewis, and their likes. So it is not true that I extend the critique in any of these directions. If anything, in fact, I limit its diachronic scope. I rein it in. I refuse to accept its sweeping historical coverage. Orientalism is not transhistorical, and it did not increase in the last two centuries in quantity, as I'm using his words. That's, these are Saeed's words, in quantity, as Saeed himself uh, has argued in, in more than one place in his book. There was no Orientalism before modernity, not even in the high cultures of antiquity, who, according to, which, according to Saeed, were also racist, again, his word. So Saeed's quantity is refused in favor of quality, a quality that is strictly modern. I may even counter by deploying a, a, an equally categorical statement. No matter how you, you uh, ethnocentric, which is another word he uses to describe uh, empires, no matter how ethnocentric and how hegemonic pre-modern empires all were, none could wed knowledge to power and redefine ethics as our modern empires did and continue to do. But how do I extend the critique, which in fact I do? It is not an accident or a chance that the 20th century, not the 15th or 12th, produced Foucault and similar others. I extend the critique by doing at least two things. First, in order to show why it is a modern phenomenon, I deepen the exploration into the genealogy, that is the roots of uh, modern knowledge, in order to excavate a structure of thought that is, um, as, as a hegemonic structure, unprecedented in human history. Second, because this structure is a foregrounding structure, it did not just sit under the field of Orientalism alone. If the structure foregrounds modern thinking and ways of seeing and living in the world, then it radiates onto all disciplines, especially the ones formed by this structure as paradigms, what I call paradigmatic fields in the book. This is the accurate meaning of expanding the critique in, on the blur. I see engineering, economics, business schools, law schools, mainstream philosophy, science, medicine, and a host of others as being epistemologically structured in the same fashion as Orientalism was fashioned. The major difference from this perspective is the substantive content of each discipline. Orientalism is the most obvious field for the study of the other, even more so than anthropology. And it is here, in Orientalism, where racism, manipulation, control, domination, and sovereignty show themselves most obviously. My argument, actually, my sustained argument, furthermore, is also that showing and practicing sovereignty over a Hindu or a Muslim in Asia is not very different from showing and exercising sovereignty over a tree or a river in the forests of Peru or Ecuador. I call each instance of these an epistemological genetic slice in the book. So this book, to make a long and complex uh, uh, story short and simple, is a study in modern sovereignty. In fact, I could have titled the book as such, A Study in Modern Sovereignty by which I mean a study in, in the sovereignty of homo modernus. That's not just political sovereignty here. The notion of sovereignty is, going, is extended to, to, to the entire range of the human existence. So it is a sovereignty of a particular kind of subject. And the subject here is, is extremely uh, important for, my, my, uh, for my, the arguments of my book. And so restating Orientalism 
is not just about Orientalism in its limited dis disciplinary meaning. It is also about subjectivity, modern subjectivity, and particularly about the author's socio-epistemic formation. I take such, such questions, or rather I ask such questions as, what does it mean to be an author? What are the types of so-called author? What is a dead author? What is a dissenting author? What is a subversive author? What is critique? And how do we distinguish critique from criticism? What are we doing now in academia? What kind of thinkers are we? Are we taking, performing our uh, uh, academic mission as we should? Are we really good critics? All these questions have driven me to take up the theory of the author in order not just to question, theoretically, Said's sweeping and unwarranted condemnation of Orientalists as racist, but I do so also as a point of entry to the study of the modern author's subjective constitution. What is the relationship between critique and subjective formation? What is the relationship between critique and ethics? From the beginning of the book, I argue that I'm happy to see some schools and departments disappear from the university, at least in their present form. But I think Orientalism, as the field that studies non-European traditions, must be retained, provided we subject it to massive methodological and philological change. That is translated epistemological form, reformation. It is my argument, which I develop in a more recent work, uh, to be published actually next year by the same press, that humility, among other related concepts, constitutes the necessary epistemological means to create and refashion Orientalism in ways that, that can convert it to an established method of interacting with and learning from the other. Humility is a potent psychoepistemic tool, a great antidote to the arrogance we have developed toward other humans, uh, other non-humans as well, uh, sentient or insentient uh, existence, with certain associated <coughs> qualities that I take up in the forthcoming book, bearing tellingly the title Reforming Modernity. Humility is a potent epistemological modality, a praxis, a habitus, if you will, that has the potential to change the fundamental structure of our perception as historians, anthropologists, economists, political theorists, philosophers, and scientists. But I must admit, given the time I have now, that I am taking you through the bridge that connects restating Orientalism with reforming modernity. Two books that tell only part of the story that I have not yet finished telling. What I have said so far is, uh, of course, a prelude to a complex discussion, which I hope will take place here. But I'm happy uh, to entertain any questions uh, you may have in the, uh, or objections for that matter. I know there would be many. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Wahel. As you have seen, we have tried to put together a panel which will be able not only to celebrate this book, but also to engage critically with Wahel. And we'll begin with Professor Rashid Khalidi, who is a, the it was Said, a professor yes. of modern <laughs> studies. <laughs> so I am beginning the, with him. There can't, be, there can't be a better positioned person to do <laughs> this than, than the Edward Said the chair, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's why I was chosen to be first. In the original list, I was third, so. Um, I, I have to admit that I, I approached, my, I, I accepted with pleasure the assignment that, uh, that Mamadou uh, imposed on me uh, uh, to, to comment on this wonderful book, which at the time that he asked me in the summer, I had not yet seen. I was abroad. Uh, I received it as soon as I got back. But I, I have to admit, I approached the topic with much trepidation. Um, I've read carefully two of Wahid's books, uh, his, his monumental work on Sharia, and his more recent work on, on the impossibility of the Islamic State. And as any of you who have read them knows, Wahid's work is dense. It is extremely sophisticated, theoretically. It's complex and it's uh, characterized by enormous erudition. And so when 
uh, Mamadou uh, contacted me in the summer as I was working on something of my own, which is much less erudite, <laughs> much less complex, I think. Um, and I, I, was, I, was, I was slightly intimidated. Um, I, I received the book, and I began reading it. And I had an enormous surprise, a pleasant surprise. It is, of course, enormously erudite. It is, it is remarkably sophisticated. But it is, to my, uh, to my in intense joy, uh, uh, an extraordinarily clear book. Uh, the argument is not a simple one, but it comes through very, very, to my way of thinking, very clearly. Um, I've read, I, I, teach, I teach Orientalism every two or three years. Um, so I've, I've taught it maybe 15 or 12 times in my career. Um, I've read it and reread it. I've read most of the critiques of the book, maybe half of them. There, there are too many. I mean, it would take a lifetime to read everything that was written about Saeed. You, you seem to have read most of it. <laughs> <laughs> and how you do that? After what became redundant, one yeah. of the points of the book. I, d I don't know how you do that. Um, in addition to having a normal life and, and writing other things. Um, because as you say, most of it is redundant and repetitive. Um, this is the most intelligent critique I have ever read uh, of, of Orientalism, the book, and Orientalism, the discipline. Um, I, I think people can stop now. I think that now that, now that what has given us this book, um, we can stop. Uh, they can stop. I'm not going to try it myself. Um, and it does something that not one of these critique does. critiques does. All of them take up Saeed's uh, uh, own effort on his own grounds, which are textual grounds, which are literary grounds. Provided uh, does a remarkable job of both extending his critique to the entirety of modern knowledge, which is enormously ambitious. And I would, I would say, to, in my limited capability to judge, very successful. But he also talks about something that nobody else does, which is the practical aspects, the way in which Orientalism operated as not just some reflector or mirror of, of the West or, or, or some tool through which the, the West self created, but as a map for the actual restructuring of the areas in which it, about which it was supposedly producing knowledge. Um, I'm not going to say much about the fact that this book is about much more than Orientalism. It's about how Orientalism is anchored in a much larger structure of modernity, a structure, uh, uh, structures that are actually the main object of this book. Uh, if you're reading this book only to uh, understand Orientalism, you will get the best, in my view, critique of Orientalism. But there's much, much more there. Um, in every sense, the book is, is, is about as the subtitle says, a critique of modern knowledge. And uh, this is something that I find quite remarkable, that what Wayne Haddad has actually tried to do is to, is to read not just Orientalism, but how Orientalism relates to discipline after discipline after discipline that are creations of modernity. He says on page, very early in the book, modernity and its human subject demand and could not be sustained without colonialism and genocide in all its forms. And then he takes that, that statement and he shows in, in great detail, using four wonderful examples, the Ottoman Empire, uh, Algeria, Indonesia, and India, exactly how that's true, but doing that through a critique of law. And I'll, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Now, I'm, I'm perhaps the least qualified person on this panel to comment on the expanse of modern knowledge, which is the, the, real, the real scope of this book. I'm going to leave that to others. But I think that looking at the critique of Orientalism and looking at, at how he, he, he explains the failures of that book to talk about practice um, is, is something that should be required reading for anyone who teaches or thinks about the, the actual Islamic world, the actual modern Middle East. Uh, I don't think you can go back, I can now go back and read texts about the Ottoman Empire, texts about Algeria, texts about India, without rethinking uh, uh, some of what I previously thought um, uh, in light of the things that Wyatt has said. And I have to say, I, as I finished reading uh, the, the, 
the, the, the chapter of the book which deals with those four case studies, I said to myself, I have two courses I have to revise. I have to include passages from this book in at least two of my courses because they force us to, to rethink much of what we thought about some of these things. Now, the questions he asks about Orientalism, the book and the discipline, are profound ones. Uh, I think one of the most profound ones is in chapter two where these four examples are laid out. On page 69, he asks, why Orientalism in the first place? And I think that's actually the right question. He goes on, why in other words do we have a phenomenon we call Orientalism, a major constellation of scholars, departments, institutes, entire institutions and foundations, specialized periodicals, book series, students, fellowships, budgets, and so on, all of which amount to an integral part of the modern Western, of modern Western academia. And, and he then goes on to say that no other culture or civilization in world history has produced such a phenomenon. And he, he mentions Islamic civilization. He mentions uh, 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 Chinese civilization. And he says, Javetti was shocked when he saw the people that Napoleon brought along with him. He says, the great uh, Chinese expeditions, naval expeditions across the Indian Ocean did not include uh, uh, philologists, archaeologists, uh, historians, and so on. Why is it that it, 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 is, it is Western subjectivity that creates the need for this? Why is it that not just this discipline, but other disciplines uh, are necessitated uh, by something uh, in uh, Western subjectivity? I, 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 I think that this is a, this is a remarkable insight. Uh, it's something I never thought about, actually. Um, and he says, of course, uh, quite, quite correctly, that what the onset of modernity means is the end of, in his view, certain important aspects of Islam, the traditional and, 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 and vital things like Sharia, don't operate ever again the way that they had previously, once you have modernity, once you have the, the, the power of modernity operating. Another enormously important insight I find is what what it notes as an enormous lacuna in Said's treatment of Orientalism, which is his glossing over the importance of law, the importance of law in Orientalism, and the importance of law in the restructuring of the countries that Orientalism was a blueprint for, that the, that the discipline was a blueprint for. And he goes in enormous detail into this. And of course, this is the person most qualified to do it, because he is the, the, the preeminent scholar on Sharia. And the way in which he goes, country by country, it, it, it's particularly resonant for me, the, the treatment of the Ottoman Empire and of Algeria. I think the one, the treatments of Indonesia and, and India, about which I'm less qualified to speak, are equally, are equally um, it, it, is, it, is, it is enormously important that things that are talked about, and when I teach this, I say, you should always look at a term like reform, which is the way in which the Ottoman Empire's transformation in the 19th century is usually described, with great suspicion. You should put it uh, through, in, 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 between scare quotes. And, and the best reason for this intuition I always had is given by Webb in this book. In, in, in a, a, a few brilliant pages from page 114 to page 118, he explains exactly what was done in the restructuring of the Ottoman Empire. The restructuring that Said gestures to, but never really talks about the actual practice of colonialism on the ground in the Ottoman Empire, a, 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 a nominally independent state, which as he correctly notes, was colonized, even though it was independent until 1918. And in Algeria, which was obviously really colonized in every <coughs> and in India, um, in which there was never a settler colony, but it was also uh, similarly colonized, as was Indonesia. Um, to my way of thinking, the treatment of, of, of law and the way in which law and the restructuring of the modern subject, changing the Islamic subject into a modern subject, is absolutely indispensable for an understanding for an understanding of what happens in the 19th century. And I say this as somebody who has for 40 years taught this and never perceived some of the links that just by reading these, these two or three dozen pages in the middle of this book, book I came to, uh, I came to understand. I think that it's quite fitting that it's the preeminent student of Sharia who has pointed out to us uh, this, the, the importance of this shift, the centrality of the way in which law is important to, to the colonizing of the, of, the, of the colonized and to the process of, that Orientalism makes possible. 
And uh, it's remarkable, I haven't, having read Orientalism many times, having taught it, th this is a perception I never, I, this is something I never noticed. I, 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 as, you say it, as you say it in the book, and you repeat it again and again in different places in the book, I say, this, how, could, I say myself, how could we have missed this? Um, it's truly fitting uh, that it be, that it be well, it had that who was, as I said, the preeminent student of Shania, uh, uh, to be the one who points this out to us, this enormous lacuna, and the centrality of this, uh, both in the way in which governance took place previously and in the new forms that the modern state and Western colonialism brings. Um, this is a brilliant book. Um, it is actually not a hard book to read, so if you're if you want to be challenged, you will be challenged. Uh, but I was very surprised to find that uh, areas that I did not expect to find easygoing were clear and comprehensible, uh, including areas that I myself was not interested in, that I myself didn't find I, I understood fully what was going on. I actually followed the train. And in those areas where I thought I understood everything, it's things that I had been teaching for my entire career, I found insight after insight after insight. So I know we're supposed to be critical. And I wish I could be more critical, um, but I can't be. Um, I found this an, an astonishingly uh, important book uh, in terms not just of modern knowledge. Uh, there, are, there are people, as I've said, better qualified than me, perhaps on this panel to talk about that. And not just as a critique of Edward Said's book or of the discipline of Orientalism, but for understanding what, what colonialism and what genocide have done um, to the part of the world that many of us study, the Middle East and the Islamic world. So I think we actually owe, owe, owe many groups of scholars and many, many groups of people uh, owe uh, an enormous vote uh, uh, of gratitude. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. 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 Um, I, I was hoping to be last, so I'll uh, um, pass questions rather than critique. Um, so I'd like to also uh, add to what Ashid uh, Khalidi said, that I also enjoyed reading the book. It's a, it's a dense work, uh, it's challenging, um, it's more than uh, about Said and the book. It's, it's, a, it's a much larger project and uh, I look forward to the forthcoming books and, and um, so uh, I'll start with uh, a few comments, a few uh, uh, things that I found interesting in the book and then the rest of my comments or critique will be in the form of a question actually and, and I hope that this will be uh, the form of a dialogue will be much more um, worthwhile. The first thing is um, the, you know, much has been written about Sarai's <coughs> Orientalism and how it fits Broadly in um, in his uh, in his scholarship and the reception of Said's work, um, I'd also like to repeat what uh, Sheikh Khalid said. It's one of the, that the book is one of the most, I think, um, uh, comprehensive and, and systematic engagement with with Said. Um, uh, Halak uh, emphasizes some of the. Um, major limits and contradictions and tensions and ambiguities in Said's work. Um, and, and for Halaq, the, the real issue is that Orientalism, as he says, is a symptom of colonial modernity rather than the cause. So it's, uh, it's part of a larger um, system of, of, uh, of knowledge where Orientalism, as he also mentions, engineering, business schools, journalism, is also part of that um, um, broader formation. Um, he, he spends, uh, he, he, he addresses several issues. One of them is the issue of authorship, which hasn't been raised yet, uh, or the author, um, more than authorship, and the issue of knowledge, uh, which I, my, most of my questions will actually be, and my comments will be about um, knowledge formation and uh, the absence of that crit critique in Said's work. Um, Halak emphasizes that the, that the problem with 
knowledge construction modernity is the Enlightenment's concept of knowledge as domination of nature, which he compares, and this is an important heuristic in the work, the comparative method or the con contrasting method with the Arabic Islamic civilization, where he discusses, I think in chapter two, um, uh, in, in several pages, um, uh, knowledge in pre-colonial Islam, medieval Islam, where he, which he describes as dialectical in nature, it's a fascinating analysis, I think, these three, four pages about um, what knowledge was in uh, the pre-modern Islam. Um, he, he mentions that um, the student, or the, the searcher, as it's called, as it's called, uh, talib, talib al-ilm, where the, uh, the emphasis here is on the act of uh, pursuit of, of, of knowledge, which is also, in Allah's terms, an ethical pursuit. Um, because here knowledge is also always connected to or inseparable from amal, ilm al amal, they always uh, go together. And uh, so it seems that his new project, which I'm looking forward to very much, um, about reforming Orientalism or the study of the other um, epistemologically, is drawing on these traditions. And that's one of the questions I have. Um, how you, you mentioned that you would like Orientalism to, to remain, to, to be, should retain that, but only if it is reformed epistemologically. And then you introduce concepts that we usually um, connect to ethical or moral values, such as humility. And um, in one of your other seminars, you talk about a, a, an act of reading which is um, humble and uh, modest and uh, listening to the text rather than subjecting the text to um, to critique, um, as we are accustomed to. Um, and this ties in with, with, the, with another discourse that you do not actually talk about in the book, which is the decolonization of knowledge discussion in the humanities. Um, and we, we've noticed in, in the last few years a big discussion in, especially places like in Africa, South Africa in particular, where the, even the campus activism students calling um, for um, a reform or de decolonization of philosophy, of the curriculum, literature, philology, a project that I'm invested in. Um, how do you locate your own work in that, in that broader movement of decolonization? Do you, um, do you see that a movement um, uh, does it, does it speak a language that is uh, different from the language of modernity? You know, this is a question that I think you discuss, an issue that you discuss on page 66, where you introduce Carl Schmitt's um, concepts of central domain and peripheral domain. And where you say, I think I, I, I quote you saying, modernity cannot be critiqued with the tools of modernity. It needs to be critiqued with something else from outside of it. And is that something that is outside of modernity? Is that the pre-colonial, pre which you are trying to recuperate or restore, um, and how can that be done in within the context of Colombia, for example, uh, or any other institution with all its um, um, limitations? Um, and 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 also this brings me to uh, to another question, which is the you know other efforts uh, in in the last few decades that also try to reform uh, the humanities and social sciences, uh, such as, you know, the, um, I think it was in the 70s or 80s, the Islam al marifa this Islamization of, of, of the humanities, which I think is based here in, in Washington, D.C., led by uh, a group of uh, mostly, actually, um, engineers and doctors, uh, Muslim engineers and doctors who wanted to, and scientists who wanted to um, humanize, they called it uh, Islamized, the humanities. Um, that that project came to to an end. I think uh, um, um, you refer in one footnote to Taha Abdurrahman, the Moroccan philosopher. Um, I would have liked to to, to read more about Taha, how you see Taha Abdurrahman's project, because he's also involved uh, very much in a critique of modernity, but also in a reform project. Uh, I think he one of his books is actually that the subtitle is. Uh, um, uh, right? A new 
introduction to modernity. Um, so are you drawing on, on, on Taha Abdurrahman's work, uh, which is largely, I think, unknown in the West because it hasn't been translated? Um, and how do you see your work uh, fit in that, generally? Um, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So it takes both daring and delicacy to criticize Thai's work, especially in our department. And one spoke practically. Yeah. And um, one spoke, I think, is an admirable combination of both. There are two ways of showing regard for an author. The first is to exalt him to the status of the last prophet. So that any attempt to extend what he says is a betrayal. The second is to take his work as a point of departure, not a final point of rest. Then the task is transformed into thinking further through his thoughts, into uh, new ideas. Wilde's book, I think, honors sides Orientalism in the second way. Why should there be a restatement of Orientalism? Two simple but distinct answers are possible. The first is that in important ways, the first statement by Said was flawed, the second that it was incomplete. While correctly demonstrates some of the inadequacies of Said's argument, primarily before he goes into a more extended discussion of performativity and Austin, the ambiguity in Said's notion of representation and his hesitations on the relation between representation and truth. I personally believe that this is something on which more work ought to be done. These are ambivalences that are never really resolved in Said's work. Said's work is a rather complex combination of large philosophical statements, which often state interstitially a number of highly significant insights, which are never expanded. What predominates in the work is a series of illustrations of his main concern, that is the representations of the Orient. Said notices the connection between the deep transformation of knowledge, what I call somewhere else, the most profound epistemic break in the history of colonial societies and the facts of colonial domination. But he does not use the two senses found in Foucault's argument about knowledge and power. Modern knowledge, this is something that uh, Weil also notes in his discussion, modern knowledge is not just aligned to power, Foucault would argue, it tends to produce a form of power that is new. Shortly after Said's work was published, Partha Chatterjee, our colleague, offered an unsettling extension of his argument by showing that Orientalist knowledge is not restricted to Europeans writing about Indians, but in some deep ways included <coughs> Indian nationalists who were writing about themselves. While extends Said's critique crucially by using the conception of performativity in a manner somewhat shifted from Austin to refer to the power of regimes of truth to what he calls enacting reality. But there's an ambiguity in this suggestion. Does this mean that this new knowledge reconstitutes the knowledge of these societies? Or does this new knowledge reconstitute reality itself? This is one of the major points of difference between Said and Weil. Said is a modernist, would object to colonialism, but not to modernity itself. Weil's next move is startling and interesting, and to my delight, it goes against the grain of much of territorial and identity-oriented forms of post-colonial reflection. Said's work has been criticized often about performing a reverse essentialization, presenting an unreasonably vast ahistorical grievance against Western civilization. Uh, while also takes it up quite pointedly, that is so comprehensive that it not merely merged romantics and utilitarians, like William Jones and James Mill writing about India, but also included in its sweep, rather implausibly, authors from Eskylas to Marx. 
I'm thinking of a famous passage which anybody who has read Orientalism would have read, would have noted. <coughs> to include Aeschylus is impossible because, implausible, because he was somewhat earlier than European colonialism, and Marx because he was at least on some levels opposed to the colonial enterprise. Certainly, Aeschylus made fun of the barbarians, but as Wilde points out, the definition of any culture includes what Buddhists would call an apoha, a logical process of definition by exclusion. It would require a boundary for the definition to work. Often such distinctions are marked by hostility, inferiorization, but also often by curiosity. To take an example from Islamic writings on India, a renowned figure like Ahmed Sirhindi advises rulers sometimes to treat Hindus like dogs, but several centuries before him, the great scholar Al-Biruni rejects actually the common Muslim perception that Hindus are simple-minded, credulous idolaters. He thinks that even Muslims tend to treat their saints sometimes like deities, blurring the religious judgment against the Hindus, and shifting the riddle of real difference between Hindus and Muslims onto the sociological peculiarity of the caste order. Muslims did not think about Hindus in a single way, <clears throat> and the task of intellectual history <coughs> is to record such differences. The essentialization that was noticed was Said's acceptance of the idea of a theoretically homogeneous West, existing unchanging from Aeschylus's time to Marx's and indeed to ours, which is a mirror image of Hegel's famous saying that India needs to be known only once by its central civilizational figures, because there the ancient and the modern are the same. Again, that strand in Said's thought, while presents a picture of the rising modern intellectual culture driven by contradiction, not merely a romantic troubled by some aspects of modernity and socialists producing some social critics of capitalism, some radical individuals like Geno, uh, on whom Weil actually spends a whole chapter, use the corpus of Orientalism itself to develop a fervent and profound curiosity about the Orient. Critics like Geno are historically significant for two reasons. The first is that they found internal critiques of European modernity in romantic, conservative, or socialist forms inadequate because these were insufficiently comprehensive, making him decide to turn to Oriental philosophical traditions like the Hindu Advaita Vedanta for a deeper and more comprehensive critique of modernity. But this first step, however startling, is not all. <coughs> he single-handedly does a process that inverses the one projected by Macaulay, refashioning his individual self in the reverse direction. I'm not surprised that Hindus did not admit him into their society. <laughs> Why it tells a very interesting story. That Hindus did not admit him into their society, and he turned to the more hospitable culture of Islamic Sufism to find a place to cultivate his counteracting, other counteracting self, counteracting in the literal sense that you know you go against the culture and acting yourself into existence. Orientalism bore a tense and complex relation with intellectuals of this kind. Romantics, <clears throat> including Jones, were interested in India and Persia out of their dismay with rising European modernity. In India, we have an example of John Woodruff, who was uh, the chief justice of the Calcutta High Court, who actually converted to Hinduism. Uh, who is a little earlier than Gunnar, who becomes a Shakta devotee, and after retirement returned to England and died in France, practicing the Hindu Shakta faith, not just writing, but in a sense living against the grain. It's in the next chapter, especially the first section, where I have some disagreements with Weil. Weil's discussion of colonialism expands onto something of a comprehensive denunciation of modernity. Um, It's a very eloquent passage, <coughs> but I think the further it goes, um, the more I become slightly uh, troubled, uh, simply because it partly reminds me of that passage in Said. So does colonialism extend, extend beyond the form of domination? Is it like Orientalism, merely a style of domination? Does it differ from other historically earlier forms? Does it have a structural connection with sovereignty over nature? Uh, in all this, I would agree uh, and say yes. Uh, 
Does it have a structural connection with sovereignty of nature? What is the meaning of this sovereignty in our world? Does colonialism have structural connections with the genocidal structure of thought and with the very modern phenomenon of genocide? Does genocide itself even appear in sites work beyond the passing mention? Does it have structural links with Orientalism? Does modernity have to do with genocide as a structure? Is genocidal modernity an analytical category amenable to the much cherished humanistic critique? Uh, and ultimately, he says, um, it is linked to progress. Does it have an organic conception with progress? Racial theories and genocide. Does progress appear inside as an analytical category at all? And does it have organic connections with secularism and genocide? Does liberalism itself have any connection with genocide? Do Orientalism and academia at large have an intimate connection with all of the above? <coughs> so does colonialism extend beyond the form of domination? I think this question is implicitly asked by Marxists and other radical thinkers. Though I believe they saw clearly only its epistemic extension, uh, sorry, economic extension, not the cultural, and certainly not the deeper epistemic aspects. Well then argues, if we turn his questions into assertoric statements, does colonialism have a structural connection with the genocidal form of thought with which, and with the very modern form of genocide? Does modernity have to do with genocide as a structure? I think his argument escal escalates onto several levels towards the critique of a deep secularist anthropocentric form of thinking that has led to genocides and ecocide, the devastation of nature, and the sustaining capacity of our planet. There is no doubt that Said never thought that his limited discussion of Orientalism bore any connection with such wider questions of philosophical anthropology and critiques of scientific knowledge in its totality. Certainly, despite Said's deep borrowings from Gramsci and Foucault, his thinking remained within the limits of a radicalized form of liberal politics. Clearly, his critique of cultural capitalism could also fit into a comfortable self-critique inside a liberal Western self-conception, which can be open and eager to disconnect itself from its colonial past, which does not want to confront the far more disquieting questions of continuities with its present. We do not have time here for a more detailed and careful analysis of our disagreements, so I have to state them schematically. Wiles' view of modernity, I think, is closer to Rousseau and, in the Indian context, remarkably similar to Gandhi, who regarded modernity as an unmixed process of degeneration of the totality of the human condition. I sympathize more with the philosophical position in Marx and Hegel that views modernity as contradictory. At this stage of human history, where both the liberating capacities of human societies and its corresponding dangers are equally vastly magnified, which therefore makes cognitive errors potentially much more catastrophic than before. Any judgment regarding modernity is conditional on our connected judgment about the nature of pre-modern civilization, pre civilization. History, while says, quoting hate and white, plots violence, this is true. History of political power, I think, is in large part a history of infamy. But I tend to think that this is true of both modern and pre-modern forms of power. Uh, I quote while, in a circulatory model, in the form that prevailed in pre-modern Islam, China, and India, history possessed, as Nietzsche vehemently argued, a moral and ethical backbone. End of quote. This is from page 267. I find that difficult to accept about India, at least about Hindu society. That society produced an immensely powerful and complex civilization and impressive forms of ethical and aesthetic thinking. But it was wholly comfortable with the practice of caste and untouchability, not to speak of degrading conceptions of women and acting them out. I cannot regard the attempt to eradicate such forms of inhumanity <coughs> as an ethical calamity. Yet, I have no difficulty in admitting Nietzsche's profound insight, along with Weil, that the major difficulty with an ethical life under conditions of modernity is what he called the problem of nihilism, wonderfully expounded further in the fourth volume of Heidegger's lectures on Nietzsche. The effect of modern science and technology on the destruction of the only nature that we have as mankind is certainly true, but equally it's the critique emerging from science about the unsustainability of that mode that is the most compelling. 
while this extension of the meaning of the term genocide to structures beyond the massacre of human beings, I think is rhetorically powerful, but we must understand the implications of that extension. There is no doubt that with the arrival of modernity, pre-modern structures are threatened with a comprehensive destruction, and often it does result in total obliteration of earlier forms of knowledge, as happened in the Indian case with the Sanskrit knowledge system. But this view underestimates the survival powers of the subaltern. Despite the grand gestures of secular states, declarations of the modernist intelligentsia, religious life not merely survives and flourishes in India in Hindu, Muslim, Christian, and other forms. Sanskrit texts certainly became hard to read, but not absolutely illegible. Indians still retain an immensely powerful aesthetic rhetoric regarding our response to the universe through music and the visual world of the arts. These are not just aesthetic and artistic expression, but also powerful forms of thinking about and relating to the world. There are clear limits, in my view, to the powers of colonial sovereignty and its capacity to change the world in its own image. Such structures of thought and sensibility do survive in the modern world in astonishingly large way. And the world would become seriously post-colonial only if we learn to treat these forms of cognitive and intellectual life with a revived respect, where I totally agree with Weil, and reacquire fluency in their natural and conceptual and cognitive languages. It's inside the universities in India that intellectuals agonize about whether they are fully secularized. The outside world, outside it, extends a world that is largely uncolonized from this point of view. To register the continued existence of such forms of thinking is to acknowledge serious, serious limits to the genocidal tendencies of colonial modernity. We should not ascribe it to a level of sovereignty. We should not ascribe to it a level of sovereignty over world history that it craves but does not really possess. I return to my agreement with Weil in his final chapter, where some of his arguments about refashioning the cognitive self. Obviously, his thinking is deeply influenced by the Islamic reflection about morals and ethics, for which there are parallels in the Hindu uh, philosophy as well. But he also draws heavily on the works of Max Scheller, for instance, precisely because the modern is a contradictory formation. Because the intellectual universe of modernity is valuable, precisely because it is contradictory. It produces figures like Marx or Freud, or Nietzsche or Scheller, and on a less heroic level, even its gunas and woodruffs. While is quite right on one fundamental point, though it's not stated clearly all within his pages, what he really admires about pre-modern traditions of moral action is their non-discursive character, or more than discursive character. A statement, this is something that I'm taking from Weil, a statement like that man is poor involves not merely a factual statement about his income, but also a demand on us to alleviate it by some form of action. And the second, as the Buddhists would stress, is always harder than the first. Modern morality is often too discursive, a series of ringing statements about the world, less reliably accompanied by suitable action. The main task is not to state, but to act. In our cognitive practice, like a Kyano or Woodruff, to act as a Hindu in an overwhelming Christian world, where his choice, would be seen as foolish. Uh, they have the moral confidence and the cognitive skill to practice a form of a deliberate alienation of the self in a sense that is entirely opposite to Marx's meaning. To act against the logic of the system in which we live, cultivate the angular, unattached existence of an alien or a stranger, to be like a renunciant who is in this world but not of it. And to quote Brecht, this is a simple thing very difficult to achieve. I thank Weil, finally, for writing a really forceful critique of modern historical knowledge. I agree with uh, Rashid that it's actually um, the best uh, critique, not merely of uh, science, but everything that is involved in our discussions of Orientalism. I also want to thank him again for allowing me to read the book while it was being written. I'm reading the book on Taha Abdul Rahman uh, now. Uh, his arguments challenged me to find my own thoughts on these questions with greater precision and clarity. That's the mark of the best kind of intellectual critical academic practice. Science work has been threatened increasingly with the staleness of excessive deference, 
Wiles book should open a second stage of that very important unfinished critical enterprise. What was implicit in Said's book, as Wilde reminds us, was nothing less than a foundational critique of the whole of the historical social sciences. Thank you. Thank you, Sudipto. Now I will give five minutes to Wahel to respond. Well, now I will need policing. Uh, uh, five I will minutes, give you five, five, five minutes. Five minutes will, will not do, but I will do my best. Uh, uh, first, some, some corrections to some of the statements that were made. Uh, from the very beginning uh, and, until now, is that the, I want to say that the, 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 the impossible state is about the, the, the Muslim self, but, but the restating Orientalism is about the Western self. So let's, let's get this clear. This, is, this book is, is for everybody. Everybody should read it. But, but, uh, <laughs> but it is actually directed at the Western self as it, the, the, the site of critique. Um, and this also is, in some sense, therefore, is not really about Islam as this impossible state was. Uh, the question first raised, interesting question raised by Mamadou is, is how did I get to this? Was it through Said that I got to the critique of modernity or the other way around? That modernity led me to. Uh, the short answer is that it has been since the beginning. Uh, in fact, I started my graduate career when when Orientalism was, was was published. Since the beginning, it has been a dialectical process. So the book played a role uh, in in this. But the, but the critique of modernity comes from about a trillion other directions, not just Said's work. So it is. It, it, and my my point is that is that it, we don't need to search for. Uh, for, for uh, sources for the critique of modernity. It's every day, it is present in, in our daily life. Every three minutes I can produce a critique. <laughs> um, uh, an interesting, uh, excellent question about decoloniality. Um, I, I, I find, um, I, I do engage uh, indirectly. Uh, I, call them, I call them my Latin American friends in the book here. Um, I do engage uh, Mignolo and Dussel in particular. Um, and and I, I appreciate their work tremendously. But I find that they, uh, um, including Kihano's work, uh, which I yet have to master more than the other two. Uh, but I find that, that, that they have not deviated much despite their unconventional uh, take on the issues of modernity and despite the, uh, the affinity I have with them, it's a very close affinity I have with them, I find them very much navigating the terrains that the political, uh, political uh, 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 economists navigate, which is, which, is that, uh, which is that materialism, um, Colonialism itself, uh, commercialism, the corporation themselves have been the cause of all of the, 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 the problems of, of modernity. What I dispute in this book, and where, where I differ with, with, with the Latin American school, is that there are prior um, thought structures in, uh, that determine why would the corporation be, in fact, even conceived. It's not enough to say, well, the, 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 uh, the experiment with the Haitians uh, uh, created some fundamental forms of modernity, as one of my colleagues says. I think this, is, this, is, this, this presupposes another whole inquiry that antedates the, the, this, this phenomenon, is what made the exploitation of the Haitians take that particular way, that particular identity, that particular form. Uh, so I, I am in that sense, a, a, in this particular case uh, of, of analyzing, I'm, I'm very much barbarian. Uh, I think that ideas have a grip on, on reality that are far more important than the material existence, although in that sense I don't, uh, materialism is, I don't take lightly either. It is, it's an important factor, but, but not when you want to explain a phenomenon like, like modernity. Uh, as for, uh, as for the book, I think uh, Shudipto already uh, mentioned that reforming modernity, the one that I, the, 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 the uh, forthcoming book, is in fact about Taha Abdul Rahman. Um, 
I engage him not only to present with, with several things in mind. One first is that he is, 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 is such of such importance and caliber that he needs to be introduced to the English-speaking world first. Second, uh, I think his ideas are extremely impertinent for the critique, critique of modernity. And third, I in fact engage with him as almost a partner. So the, yes, in that sense, we, there, there is a great intellectual affinity between our projects. Uh, I'm not sure I can be the um, religious ethicist he is, um, but, but I think his ideas are fundamentally important in order to be presented for the secular audience in ways that can appeal to them. Uh, how much I am indebted to Taha, it's, uh, your guess is as, as good as mine. Uh, I'm not sure how much I'm indebted to anybody. I'm indebted to everybody. I read him, I think he highly of him, but I read others as well. So it is, it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a collective. Uh, finally, the, um, the point, the fundamental point that uh, Shudepto raised, sorry? Uh, yeah, I do have, of course. I, I do have differences with Taha. Uh, but this is where we, where we, 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 we argue with him. Um, in fact, he read the book, and I, I answered his, uh, his own critique of the book. In, so it is, it is, in fact, the book itself is a dialogue, in a sense. Um, as for uh, Shudipto's point about, uh, basically, Shudipto's point is about, about agency. This, this, it goes to the issue of agency. Is, is to what extent uh, am I, I, am, I am inaccurate or wrong about saying that structural genocide, which dominates the theme of the, the, second, of the second part of the book, uh, how much structural genocide has indeed not allowed uh, for the possibility of genuine, authentic forms of traditional society survival. In other words, how much the, the, of, 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 of uh, the colonized world has managed to, uh, in fact, retain and play some sort of um, um, uh, Asian, Asian, agential autonomy in, in, in maintaining some of the traditional forms. My argument is that it, there is no such traditional form that exists in modernity that is really traditional. Modernity has not allowed for, for when, when, when the Chinese and Muslims conquered countries left and right, uh, they, 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 uh, they basically adopted a policy, especially the Muslims about whom I know much more than the Chinese, they adopted the policy of, okay, you just pay us taxes, we will protect, you are politically, you belong to us, you pay taxes and, and, and you maintain your own uh, laws, uh, 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 traditions, whatever you want. They were literally communities within communities. So this is why, for example, Christians and Jews and others, could, in, the, in the Middle East at least, I'm one of them, one of those Christians, who managed to basically live within a Christian community on terms of our community within a Muslim majority until about uh, uh, the 20th century. Uh, I don't think that, that uh, the, we, we, I think we have overstretched the, the concept of agency. I challenge it, uh, challenge it in the book, because I think the, the discourse on agency has been produced precisely by modernist discourse in order to militate against the voices of, of, the, of the colonized, those who are arguing that we are entitled to more, that we have not, our, our who we are has been, has been forgotten. Uh, I think the agency is, is a discursive weapon. This doctrine of agency is a discursive weapon that, to be honest with you, I think you fell for it. I don't think that, that we should uh, uh, um, submit to it so easily. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, any of us has maintained their, their identity in any form of, let's say, the time of 200 years ago. Thank you. And you are in the book too. <laughs> but, but just a couple of points that I. Uh, one is a caveat about your use of the notion of humility in your subsequent work uh -huh. since the book. Yes. Um, you know, Nietzsche made it very clear that one can't take humility at face value, mm. and that it in fact is a very dark, submerged. Uh, 
Concerned with humility in the ethical realm, that's the genealogy of Lawrence, but you're more concerned about it in the cognitive realm, of the epistemological realm. But I don't think it really is very different. And, uh, and I think it does hide an enormous amount of the will, well, Nietzsche called it the will to power, but there are other sorts of descriptions you can give to it. So it's just a caveat that, in fact, a whole range of these dominations come from a certain Christian outlook, right? Related to humility, you are saying? Well, no, it's slightly more complicated. So humility comes, humility as a Christian ideal of ethics is got an underside, right, which goes a long way back, much prior to modernity, saying there are similar things to be said about humility in the cognitive realm, yeah. and they may actually reflect a much a very similar as will to domination, uh, which is what Nietzsche's main claim was. And so it's just a caveat against using that concept. And in fact, it, it really does raise a quest, further deep question about if it goes back to, to if these dominations go back, Nietzsche's right, to various Christian ideals, mm -hmm. then, then to that extent it complicates the idea that it only meant modernity. So that's, that's something in general. But can I just raise a, a question about uh, what Shilipto and the exchange between you and Shilipto. You see, Shilipto's main point, which you slightly transformed into the notion of it as, as uh, expressing the notion of agency, is basically that the reach of modernity is not comprehensive. That it is pretty powerful and so on, but it's not comprehensive. And so there are, in the interstices, possibilities of, of conceptual locations even within modernity, even within the heart of the most modern person. Mm. Like that's what psychologists call the frame problem. In one frame, a very modern person could have a very uh, uh, unmodernized uh, psyche. And uh, so, so part of the trouble, though, is that when it comes to, to articulate anything which is outside, so you say you can't use the tools of modernity to criticize modernity. But suppose you did. Right? So, so take some, something like Morales of Bolivia, who is who's, uh, appealing to indigenous ideas about nature, the very thing <coughs> that you're talking about. He cannot even appeal to those indigenous ideas without using the modern vocabulary of, of how forests have rights. Mm. I mean, it's just, there is nothing he can do to avoid that vocabulary. But isn't that support to right. my argument? Well, no, the, the, it is a, uh, it is a, Not it's his, support of, yeah, it's a support of your argument, but, but what I, what I would suggest is that, that the way to understand uh, Shilipto's point is, therefore, that you cannot think of going completely outside the tools of, of the modern in order to criticize it. You're stuck with a sort of bricolage within modernity, within which to. So you can't have, as it were, a whole semantics by which you say, I'm, I'm going to look for truth somewhere else and so on. It has to be sort of a bricolage within them. The, and, and there have to be alliances made between the modern <coughs> and pre-modern. After all, there can be alliances made between between Gandhi's ideas and Marx's ideas. Yeah. There's nothing there which you, you know, it's, uh, which, which is uncompulsory uh, about that. It's perfectly feasible to do it. And I think that's probably the thing that you were most deeply trying to do. Thanks. Can I answer this quickly? <laughs> okay, okay, that's no. uh, James, James. Yeah. Um, just a, a, a quick question, yeah, and I haven't had an opportunity to read the book, but you know, noticing a certain aspect of the makeup of the panel. Um, and thinking that, you know, at, at where I come from, at least in conscious practice, the modern resonates as a kind of crisis point in representation, right? So if you're, if you're going to postural through, you know, so-called modern art practices, a uh, kind of crisis in particular, often of a kind of masculinist subjectivity, 
national asymmetry that then gets performed in different ways that leads to critiques of performativity and performance um, that then get read back. And so I'm, you know, I'm hearing lot, lots of uh, references um, tonight to a great number of thinkers and, and, um, and regimes of thought. And I'm just wondering if in uh, the work itself that we haven't discussed, the issue of uh, let's say kind of, uh, kind of male subjectivity and, and, and sovereignty rise to the, the surface here in terms of the discussion. Mm -hmm. My question is actually very simple. Um, uh, in recent years, it's been argued that uh, the state is produced in, in the abstract sense, is produced as an effect. Can we uh, extend that same argument to Orientalism? Can Orientalism be thought of as an effect of discourse? Why and why not? And uh, uh, in that sense, I'm particularly interested in the idea of question framing. So uh, in, the, in the idea, if we put Orientalism as an effect, how does it um, what kind of as an effect or an impact? Effect. Ah, effect. Effect. How does it? How does that uh, view uh, our perception of, of the discourse? Or if it's in and of its if it's a discourse that stands in and of itself, um, if there is going to be a different you know difference between the, both of the framing, that's the question. Okay. Um. I'm not really sure I understand your question, but, but, but at least I can answer the first part of it, that, that as, uh, as noted by Rashid, that I see Orientalism as an effect of, of uh, is it the same way as I see the corporation, for example, which plays an important role in my analysis throughout the book almost, from the colonialism of in, from the colonialism of India until Walmarts and, and, uh, 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 and the uh, Microsoft. Uh, that, that these are effects of a particular way of conceiving the world. Uh, in any case, I, I, I must uh, here admit one of my great weaknesses, uh, that in fact, and I got critiqued for it uh, a couple of times before, uh, at least, that, that, that uh, gender issues have not entered into this analysis. Uh, but, but in the impossible state, I do, I do um, go into, into the issue of nationalism and the makeup of the state um, as a male, um, as, 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 as a masculine. Uh, uh, many people disputed this and thought that nationalism actually is a feminist, uh, but I could not relate to this very well. It, the, the, the gender aspect is missing from here. Uh, you are right. But I couldn't see now, if I were to think, how would I incorporate it without expanding the book significantly? But that's a solid point. That's a solid point. Um, for, uh, thank you for the remarks about the humility. I think it's, it's extremely important. Um, you are actually alerting me now that I have to be very careful about what I mean by humility in a, in a genealogical. Um, fortunately, my, 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 my inspiration for this is not it's not even Nietzsche in this case, although I'm, I'm, I'm a big, big reader of Nietzsche. Uh, w w the source of inspiration is Taha Abdul Rahman himself in this case. And it's not even with the concept of humility. In fact, I derive this from another concept called Haya in her. The concept of Haya, as he develops it in the three volumes that just came out uh, after this book was went to press, is, uh, is, is, is so... Uh, in, so recondite and extensive and dense that I could derive from it at least tentatively. What's the exact translation? Haya. It's very difficult to translate. If anybody who's an Arab is here, uh, it, Haya is actually, literally, it's like shyness, being shy. That's the lexical, immediate lexical meaning. But this, sorry? The modesty and humility in the complicated sense. But I derive from this uh, a concept of humility. As I said in the lecture, there are associated concepts as well, so it's not the only one. There are other things I am working with. Uh, and in fact, this is only the, the, even the next book of next year is, is the beginning of the exploration of these concepts. Uh, but at least I, laid the, I think I begin to lay the, the grounds for this. So I will, I will take this... Uh, um, um, 
I will take this as a, as a very constructive and uh, uh, helpful comment for future future work. But uh, I'm not sure I continue to agree with, uh, or rather I should say, I continue to disagree mm -hmm. with both the t tenor of the arguments because what, what you are actually saying is, and what you are actually uh, uh, articulating uh, in terms of what you have to say is actually an, an, a total, uh, a, a total uh, um, uh, agreement with, with my position, which is that, in fact, from you are saying that we, you cannot critique modernity from outside modernity, that we are locked into this. Uh, so you have, one has to admit that agency, uh, the agency for anything outside of modernity, which is actually modern, not pre-modern, will, will have to dissipate anything that is pre-modern. There is no such voice for the pre-modern to modernity, despite all the that's where I, I think that you, both discourses, in fact, support my point, not your yes, Shadipta's point. I, I can't have feeling then that Shadipta misrepresented her. So if I think you're not, I'm just going by them. But, but what I want to say is that, what I want to say is that, uh, um, uh, what was the other point? There was another point for, uh, um, uh, that, that in fact, uh, in fact, there is, um, there is a possibility within the cracks of modernity actually to, 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 to at least begin to offer a, a, a cure for modernity from outside of modernity. We, we do live in a, in, 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 a, in a world of contradictions. We do live in a, in, in a system that allows for... But you see, can I just, this is interesting for me, Contradiction is the wrong concept. Mm. <coughs> you see, because really it's, psychology has this idea of a frame. And this, we call it the frame. Mm -hmm. The problem is that we think in two different frames, but we never unify the frames. That's true. Right? So we never even realize we're being inconsistent. That's what I mean by contradiction here. Yes. Well, no, you can't mean by contradiction that it's not a contradiction. You mean that there is no contradiction because it's actually two different things that you think. But they are contradictory, but you live with they're them. Not con <laughs> no, they're not contradictory. No, you can only find a contradiction in a unified frame. That's the Well, notion. that's one definition of contradiction. No, it's the only definition. <laughs> if you say B and not B. If you say B in one frame, mm. and you say not B in another frame, and you haven't combined mm. the frames, you are not contradicting yourself. Mm -hmm. So you need another notion. But, but, but that's, that's not the deep part. The, the point is that we, each one of us, forget about the, the, uh, the indigenous tribal in the heartland of India or, or Bolivia or anything. Each one of us thinks in a frame that is being completely taken over by modernity and also one which is comes from all sorts of atavistic groups which are, it may be completely outside the scope of modernity. Each one of us. For, you know, I, I mean, for but one we just say that we, 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 there is no possibility of getting out of modernity. No, no. I agree with, okay, so that's what I was saying was the more complex thing. I agree with you, though, that there are, the, the reach of modernity is not comprehensive. You have indigenous groups. Who, whose lifestyle is very often has evaded many aspects of modernity. Even each one of us has, has done so. But all I'm saying is that we've done so and yet we're also very modern in, and we think in both frames. And the real question is, can we possibly, and I think it should be one of the chief goals of politics, of a humane politics, to try and remove the boundary between frames so that we understand that we are in fact contradicting each other and try and criticize ourselves from within ourselves and so on. And that's really yeah. giving a kind of agency which I think should have been struggling to figure yeah, but, but, but the problem is that is it possible to precisely push <coughs> such bound if we agree at least on one thing, which is the pretension of modernity following, uh, you know, uh, Shelley, Pollock, that it's about erasing or submitting any other thing which is pre-modern. I, I think it is the problem we are facing. Because if you take the discussion about the African reality, it's exactly also what Mudimbe is saying, that you cannot escape 
the Korean library, you are forced actually even to act against it, to rely on that. And, and I think that uh, Shelley Pollock's discussion of pre-modernity and, and, you know, contrasting what he called an Indian modernity to a Western is precisely about this radical difference between, between the two. So my question is still, can we escape modernity? I would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very quickly, we will take Gail and the last two. Okay, three. Gail. Um, so you said that another title for the book was uh, Modern Sovereignty it's or something. You I said that another title that you uh, could have used for the book yeah. was something like Modern Sovereignty. Yes. Um, which, uh, and, and, and you, you do spend a lot of time on, on the author, uh, which is a strange institution for you to actually spend so much time on, given the scope of what it is that you criticize. But, modern, uh, but sovereignty is obviously not just an idea. And you made the point that you're not that interested in materialism. You're interested, but you don't think that that's the most important, that, that ideas are more important. Um, which is why, of course, the subtitle of the book um, is about knowledge. Um, I'm, I'm not surprised that a scholar would be invested in knowledge and think that knowledge is the most important, but if an alternative title for the book is sovereignty, sovereignty is obviously a different kind of institution and not just an idea. It is something in action, and the fact that you link knowledge to genocidal practices obviously indicates that you see uh, uh, you, you have a, a, a slightly different formula for power and knowledge, mm. but that which you are after is a particular configuration of power and knowledge. Genocide and, and, and knowledge, genocide and a particular division of, of knowledge, and also genocide as, uh, uh, as, as a knowledge power practice and, uh, and series of institutions. So my question is why, uh, and, and one of the solutions is humility, whatever the proper, uh, uh, the proper term is, which obviously is not an ID either, but uh, 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 a matter of conduct, a disposition, uh, an ethical, as you mentioned, a, habitus. Abdel Ahmad, yeah. a, a, ha a habit, which is not an habitus. idea. A habitus, which is not an idea, which is also an idea, but obviously cannot be summarized and reduced to its ide uh, ideal content. And yet you keep insisting on knowledge, and what needs to change is our relation of knowledge, our division of knowledge. It seems that what you're calling for is, in fact, um, much less humble, if I may put it this way, and much more uh, all-encompassing, which is that modernity is a epistemico-political uh, project, and that's what needs to change. What it will take to change that is obviously not, not to be confined to knowledge practices. It requires a transformation that is much broader than one virtue and certainly a division of knowledge. So uh, uh, given the ambition, leaving humility aside, given the ambition and that you yourself uh, uh, propose an alternative title, sovereignty, isn't your critique in fact um, only marginally epistemological and, uh, um, and much more massively um, institutopolitical? No, I, it's, it's an excellent question, uh, but I, I think I, I was hoping that you by now uh, serving on functions you serve, you have read Reforming Modernity. Because if you read for Reforming Modernity as one of the functionaries of uh, Columbia University Press, you realize that actually I take, I take this book, The Stating Orientalism, now in a direction where I move from what I call diagnostics into the palliatives. Uh, in diagnosti diagnostics require, of course, uh, knowledge. You need first to, to understand something before you begin to practice anything. Once you establish that is practice, or rather I want to call it praxis, which is fundamental to a habitus, which is also fundamental to, to human existence, wh wherever they are, then it becomes about, about, about actual life as it is practiced, as it is lived. But you cannot move there before you do the theoretical work first, or the diagnostic work. The stating orientalism is diagnostics. Uh, 
reforming modernity moves into from from the diagnostics to the to the palliative and i'm hoping that there will be others that i don't know exactly how it's going to work but i i, I hope that the move will be towards more and more palliatives than uh, but but uh, the, the your question would be totally legitimate uh, about this book but then when if you put it in the context of my project uh, i think i have attended to these concerns but it's an excellent question and go they, 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 the the thrust of it goes so much into what taha abdul rahman wants to say so i'm, I'm very sorry but we cannot give the floor to more colleagues and students but i can tell you once MISA's graduate students are planning to organize also a discussion around the program. And we'll take more time because we have much larger contacts. What I would like to do is thank you for coming. Thank you, Raymond Sanders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.